The Genesis 6 narrative states that the Nephilim are on the earth in those days and also afterwards. If that's true, can we find evidence that corroborates this? I'm L.A. Marzulli. Join me as we go on the trail of a Nephilim. Called the Prince of the Power of the Air. Because there's real demonic power and forces behind these locations. I heard a commotion and I turned around and. Uh, there's no question, there's a spiritual implication. Holy. Is it was built upon monolithic stones, which so it was originally a Nephilim stronghold. So what we're seeing, we're seeing that little stick figure. From the table was actually levitating by itself. These sites are Nephilim architecture. Uh, have anything to do with fallen angels and of course that means demonic activity and something hits me right on my belt knocks like knocks the breath out of me hi everyone we're live Yes, and we don't have to tell you who we're with. We're with L.A. Marzuli. We've been waiting for weeks for this interview. Yay. Hi, L.A. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Oh, thank you for being oh, on. Thanks for being on. So we have seen this film. This is incredible, L.A. Why are Make you so fascinated with the mounds in America, first of all? Well, the, the, the overarching theme of the series is called On the Trail of a Nephilim. And as you, as you, you played in, in the intro there, um, Genesis 6 states the Nephilim are on the earth in those days and also afterwards. And most of us just skip over that. Mm -hmm. But the New Agers and people like the ancient alien crowd, they're all over this thing, although they don't know it's the Nephilim. Um, but what we see is a, is a phrase I've coined a while back, Fallen angel technology, Nephilim architecture. The technology is from the fallen ones, and the Nephilim, the offspring of the sons of God, the fallen angels and the women of earth, are sort of the, the, you know, the, the, uh, the labor force behind all this thing. So the overarching theme is on the trail of a Nephilim, and as I pose, if a Nephilim were on the earth in those days, do we find evidence of that? And it's, all, it's everywhere. It's here in the Americas. And that's who people don't get. It's like right under our noses in the Americas, from the Ohio uh, area up in Lake Michigan all the way down to the Gulf Coast. And it spreads out. We get little little bits of it in Chaco Canyon. We get, you know, the, the, um, the six-fingered red-haired giants were out in Catalina Island. I mean, I discovered a picture um, that Ralph Gooden, who was a primitive archaeologist between 1919 and 1921, was employed by the Hay Museum, and uh, he had a, a cache of records that went missing for about 50 years. And when they found it, all these archaeologists and anthropologists went there and they sorted everything out. I got wind of this, and I asked if I could come out and see it, and they said no. So this went back and forth for six months. They were going to build a new museum. Finally, I said, how about if I donate $1,000 to the museum? The doors <laughs> opened up. I went out. That's how things work. And, um, you know, within an hour, I'm finding stuff that just shouldn't be there. Elongated skulls, six fingers. And we found the pay dirt picture where Ralph Gooden is leaning on a shovel. And in front of him is a very large skeleton in situ, which turned out to be basically a nine footer. Basically a nine footer. So that's not normal. Six fingers is not normal. Elongated skulls are not normal. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. So in, in the Mound series, or Amateur of a Nephilim series, the first three in that series deal with the Mound Builders in America, because that's, that's ground zero. But here's where it goes off the rails. 
We've already been to Israel. We've filmed at Gilgal Raphaim, the circle of the giants. We filmed in the chamber. We've been to Gozo. We've been, we've been to Sardinia. We've been to Malta. We've been all throughout Europe, Spain, France, Portugal, and the UK. We've got hours and hours and hours of film, which we haven't even begun to start editing and, and show up. We are, we've been to America's Stonehenge and we're there for five days and filmed hours and hours of footage. We were in Europe just a few months ago for 24 days. And that, whoa, it must have been great. I like touring Europe. No, <laughs> it was from, from sun up to sundown, work, 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 interview, yeah. set up the cameras, get the shot, fly the drone. I mean, we were we came home, we were exhausted. Um, and why do we do it? Our mission statement is to expose the deception of the prince of the power of the air and to herald the return of the king, Jesus. And we take that literally and very seriously. Uh, and so these films, especially episode three, exposes what's really going on, exposes the finger works um, of, the, of the dragon, shows that there are supernatural fingerprints all over these things. And it's right here in America, for crying out loud. And the church, for the most part, won't deal with it. But, you know, the church is beginning to wake up. And I find amen. that I find that really good. Yeah, amen. I'm so glad you took us back to Ralph Glidden because this is maybe a new audience for you. And so it's important that they know a little bit of your history. So L.A.'s from California, and he went out and laid hands on these giant, this all this stuff that has been covered up. So I'm glad that he mentioned that. So L.A., why is your take on who built these mounds in America, you call it ground zero, why does that differ from mainstream archaeology? Mainstream archaeology, and we, we demonstrate this specifically in, in, in really all three films get into it on some level. But I think two, one and two, uh, the mysterious mound builders and mathematical mysteries of the mound builders, that's number two. Uh, mainstream archaeologists will tell us that Native Americans built all this stuff with, with single basketfuls of dirt that they used, primitive hose, digging sticks, they gathered the dirt, put them in the baskets, and off they went. Well, we hired a flint napper, a guy who makes um, flint uh, replicas for museums. So this guy makes us this beautiful hoe, which burnt in the fire. I don't have it anymore. Bummer. And, I mean, it looked like the real deal. We hired a fit laborer. He went out to a field near Poverty Point under the supervision of our uh, archaeologist, anthropologist, um, Rick Woodward. He's on our team. And so Rick went out with this guy, and they began to dug, and he timed it. And it took about 16 minutes to get one 30-pound basket full of dirt, and then hollow to the site, roughly 16 to 20 minutes, somewhere in that vicinity. That's not tamping it down and trying to create something. That's just dumping the dirt and taking your feet and kind of going like this, okay? <laughs> Poverty Point, which is the second largest mound in the United States, is about 390,000 tons of earth. So when you start doing the math, what it is is 28 million single buckets of earth. Then there's another site, yeah, there's another site called um, <clears throat> Fort Ancient. And we've been there, and it's a mind, it's a mind blower. It's got 3.5 miles of continuous mounds with what we believe are 66 gates. Archaeologists say 67 gates. We go 66 gates. We were there mm -hmm. on the spring equinox, and we had Peggy's star, my wife's star, uh, chart on her cell phone and we're looking at the gate and the sun is coming right up over this gate right it's due east guess guess what the constellation was the water serpent hydra you can't make you you can't make this stuff up you can't make <laughs> this stuff up it's unbelievable so we're there and there's in the film mysterious mound Bill, is the very first episode which you can get on on vimeo that's the only one on vimeo right now so L.A. Marzulli is the Vimeo link if you're interested. The other two, you can only get DVDs. Um, and it's episodic, so, you know, every everyone, when, when four comes out, two gets posted on Vimeo. That's the way it works. So there's a docent um, who's talking about Fort Ancient, okay? And he's telling, and he's, and he's, he's just, he's drunk the Kool-Aid, in my opinion, with all due respect, He's, he's bought the party line. That's fine. He can believe whatever he wants to believe. But I can push back on that. And I can believe whatever I want to believe. Okay? Right. He's trying to tell us 
that if you deconstructed the 3.5 uh, miles of continuous earth mounds and put them in dump trucks, this is his words, not mine, you have 200 miles of end-to-end -end dump trucks, 200 miles of end-to-end -end dump trucks filled with dirt. Now, that's just one site. There are 10,000 mounds in Ohio. They're all over the place. They're all over the place. And when um, archaeologists would go, well, the Shawnee built a serpent mound. We talk about the serpent mound in all three films. It's, it's, it's a focal point. The Mayan elders in 2011 came up and did a ceremony to open up the gateway there at the Great Serpent Mound in Ohio. And we show that in the film. But in the first two films, we go back of a serpent mound. Chief Joseph Riverwood of the Tiano Peace Chief states on the record that, and he's, he's adamant about it, and you can see his countenance change. He gets kind of ticked off because the archaeologists have, have signage up on the, uh, uh, all throughout the serpent mound explaining that the Shawnee built the serpent mound. The Shawnee chief, Chief Wallace, and we show this in the film, went on record stating, and I quote, that while the Shawnee always respected the mounds, we did not construct the serpent mound. So here you've got the chief of the Shawnee saying, no, 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 we didn't build the serpent mound. And you've got mainstream archaeology force feeding all this down everybody's throat. It's, un it's unbelievable. You want to talk about a travesty. And when you come up with different, uh, any type of a different paradigm, uh, any type of a, um, a different way of looking at things or trying to explain it, um, they have answers for everything. I'm not part of the club. I never will be. I never will be. I'm, I'm not degreed in archaeology. Uh, I, I don't hold on to their paradigm. I'm a rabid, born-again, you know, right-wing Christian knucklehead conspiracy theorist. That's how they think. Amen, you know, Amen brother. Isn't that great? <laughs> I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a deplorable too. So all that to say this, that when in the second film, we dug deeper and we showed the mathematical um, factors that are embedded in the mounds. Now, I don't know anything about trigonometry. I know just enough trig to get me in a whole lot of trouble. I know it's complex. I know that, you know, it's way above my pay grade. I, I, geometry, I can kind of, you know, get my head around. Trig, there's no way. It's just like, Neh. so I need to go to people who know trig, which we did. And there's a surveyor we hired, um, uh, Todd Willis. And, and Todd goes out and we had him survey the Great Circle Mound in Ohio. Now, I don't know whether anyone's done that or not, but we did it. And he's out there with surveying equipment. And what he discovers to his, kind of blew him away, now, the Great Circle Mound is 1,200 feet, about 1,250 feet in diameter, all right? And the mounds at, at the entrance are, are, are up around maybe 20 feet, and then they kind of gradually slow down to about 8 feet, all right, all the way around. This is really big. And if you've ever been there, it's, I think it's like 32 acres. Um, I, I'll Google that if we take a break, and I'll let you know. It, it's really large. It's not, it's big. It's huge. You walk, the first time I was there, before I get into what, what Todd Willis said. I was there, and this would started me on the trail. Someone said, Russ Dizdar, my, my bada buddy, said, L.A., do you know where you are? And I go, yeah, I'm in Newark, Ohio. And he starts laughing. He goes, no, do you know where you are? And I go, yeah, Russ, I'm at a conference in Newark, Ohio. And he goes, are you at your computer? And I go, yeah. And he goes, Google uh, Nephilim Chronicles Fallen Angels in the Ohio Valley. I'm going like, what? <laughs> I Google it. It's, Fritz, it's Fritz's book, Fritz Zimmerman's book. And my jaw hits the ground. So I'm going, I'm right down the street from this thing. My hotel's here, like three miles down the road. There's a circle mound. I go to my host and I go, look, tomorrow the conference ends at one o'clock. I want you to take me to the circle mound. Have you ever been there? And he goes, no, I've, I go by it every day, but I've never been there type of thing. It's like, my God. So I walk in. He, he just drops me off. He's not interested in checking it out. I, so I call him when I'm done. So give me a call. I'm, you know, only 10 minutes away. I'll come pick you up. I go, okay, great. So I'm out there and I'm walking up to this thing. My spidey senses are tingling. I'm like already <laughs> going like, oh, you've got like goosebumps talking about it. And I walk into the entrance and I stand at the entrance, which originally we believed there were two serpent heads and the mounds are 20 feet. And there's a moat that goes all the way around the circle mound. Okay. And I just, I just stood there 
in absolute awe, dumbstruck at what I was looking at, realizing that the Lord was about to move me into a whole new adventure, which is what he did. Um, and here we are, you know, years later with, you know, three films on this and, and six films all together that talk about all this. We're on the trail of a Nephilim. So Todd Willis is out there and he's, and he's surveying the moat. And he finds, to his astonishment, and mine, essentially it's level, six inches to a foot in 1,200 feet. And that can be, yeah, that can be because of, you know, thousands of years of dirt falling down, whatever. For all practical purposes, it's level. So that begs the question, how do you do that in the ancient world? How do you, there's no water there, so how do you know that it's level? How did you fill up the moat? Because it was filled up, we believe, with water. There were no trees there thousands of years ago. This was a, a ritualistic site, and this is where the fallen ones would come down, in my opinion. This, this is still a charred site, which is why the Mayan elders went there into the Serpent Mound. The Mayan elders in 2011 went to these places. Why did they go there? They know who it is. They know who they serve. They know who the Serpent Mound is. They opened up the gates. And they did it from coast to coast, literally opened up the gateways. That's what they that's what they did in 2011. So, I mean, this is like, and when you go to these places, you need to pray up before and afterwards because stuff For happens, sure. as, we'll, as we'll get into a little later. So that just gives you an idea of um, <clears throat> a little bit about the Serpent Mound and the Great Circle Mound in Ohio. So the mathematics, the Circle Mound and the Octagon Mound were at one time, and they still are, Essentially, it was one big complex, three and a half square miles, one huge complex, ritualistic, unbelievable. And then when you're in the Octagon Mound, I've been there like three times, and you stand in it, and you look, and you go, okay, I don't know what this is. Because you don't. Because you're inside this thing. It's I think it's like 50 acres, 52 acres, something really stupid. And when you're in it, you don't know what you're looking at. But when you fly the drone up, it's a precise octagon, and it's not an equal octagon. All eight sides is unequal, and this is where the trigonometry comes in. This is where the advanced mathematics comes in. How did they do this, and why would you do it, and how do you check your work? If you can't see your work, how do you know you've done it right? You don't. You don't know, and archaeology, mainstream archaeology, just dismiss all this. Oh, well, Native, you know, it's a racist statement to think that Native Americans couldn't have trigonometry. Excuse me. This is built before people in Europe had trigonometry. Hello. So there's nothing racist about it. I don't care who these people were. It makes no difference who was here. And the fact that the Shawnee who came into the area tell us that they didn't do any of this, that, oh, but we're, we'll ignore what they have to say because now, now who's the racist? Because they don't have a written language. So we see advanced mathematics, advanced surveying techniques, knowledge of precession. And this is where, to date, no one has been able to offer me an explanation on this. Nobody that I've talked to. Okay. They won't. They won't or can't. They can't. Mm. Wow. These sites, all these sites are built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Many of them are. So, you know, we, we, we throw that phrase around. Oh, Stonehenge, England is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Oh, America's Stonehenge is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Oh, the Great Serpent Mound is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Oh, the Great uh, Octagon Mound in Ohio is built on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle. Okay, so how do you know that the moon is on an 18 and a half year lunar cycle? How does anyone know that? Well, let's go back 3,000 years. And so Bob and Ted get up one morning and they and they they're going, you know, the moon, the moon seems to be moving around in the sky. And Ted goes, you know, Bob, you're right. Maybe we should stay up tonight and see what it does. So Bob and Ted go out, they've got paper and pencil, they've got a couple of telescopes, and oh, it's it's it just came up over there. Oh, we it goes up to the top and now it goes down over here. Wow, we've got one day. They chart all that out. Next night, Bob and Ted go out again. Oh, there it is. They chart the thing out. They do this for 30 days. They're going, this is really cool. The moon's really moving around. Here's the deal. They don't know where they are in the cycle. Are they in year 10, year 4, year 12, year 1? They don't know. 
So they do like 30 days. All of a sudden, this terrific rainstorm comes in. There's fog, thunder, lightning, clouds. They can't see the moon for a week. Now what? Now what? So how do, yeah. So how do they know? How do they know it's an 18 and a half year lunar cycle? How? Who discovered yeah, who, that? Where does it come yeah, from? Yeah, who knows that? And we know from the Book of Enoch. Yeah, we know from the Book of Enoch that the fallen angels came down and showed knowledge of procession and the celestial bodies. That's where it comes from. Just like the first abortion, it was given to women how to kill the embryo in the womb by a fallen angel. That's where it comes from. Wow. So you suggest in your film, so you and nobody else can give you an explanation. So your explanation is fallen angel technology and Nephilim architecture. So can you kind of speak to what Dr. Michael Lake is talking about in your film? Well, you know, Dr. Michael Lake is, is, a, is just a, a really good friend and a, a, a colleague, and he's been searching into all this like I have for years, decades, and studying it all. And he believes that these are Nephilim sites, that they are highly charged, and that it, it, it goes back and back and back and back, really, to the Tower of Babel. I mean, that, that's where it goes back to. It's, it's Luciferian. It's satanic. Um, many of these sites are, are no longer active. And this begs the question, and I've got some sort of biblical precedent. Um, I thought about writing a book, and I may or may not, um, but I've talked about it enough, so I probably won't write the book. But um, we know from the Bible that there's 180,000 Syrians that are outside, and they're going to attack Israel. And one angel is dispatched. And the next day, all the Syrians are slain. We also know, and this is the work of Tim Alberino, who was searching the, um, the documents from the Spanish conquistadors who came in Peru. And they talked about the giants in Peru who were out in the field and they were performing homosexual acts on each other. Really crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, an angel appeared in the sky and smote them with some kind of lightning bolt thing, killed them all. So with that in mind, is it possible? Sodom and Gomorrah is another perfect example. So God allows this to come to its full, and then he goes in and he acts. Uh, he tells Abraham that, you know, you're going to be a great nation, but you're going to want to move you down to Egypt. You'll be there 400 years until the sin of the Amorites comes into its fullness. There's biblical precedent for this all day long. And then he cuts them loose after all the miracles. And then knowing that they're going to blow when they go up there, knowing that they're going to see the giants because that's what freaked them out. Not little guys who were six feet tall, guys who were 12 to 15 feet tall. And, you know, he knows what they're, he knows that Israel isn't going to be able to handle it, but he, he does it anyway. So there's precedent with the with the sin of the Amorites, Sodom and Gomorrah, um, I mean, non-biblical stuff, it's there. And so I wonder whether these sites were deactivated by the Lord himself. He allowed it to a point, and then he sends the good guys in, and they deactivate it. Wow. So speaking of that, you mentioned s some things in the film that can only be described as demonic manifestation attached to some of these sites. So could you first explain to our audience maybe what a charge site means? A charge site means that rituals have been done there to the dragon, to Satan. Uh, in most cases, it's, it's um, human sacrifice. Uh, blood has been shed. Um, it can be animals, but in most cases, it's human sacrifice. So the blood, the life is in the blood. When blood is spilled, this is where the demons come in and they feed off of it. Uh, going back to the abortion tobacco, 1.5 billion abortions. That's a Luciferian sacrifice. It, it has changed the spiritual atmosphere on this planet, in my opinion. Completely changed yeah. it, utterly changed it. And this is why yeah. a lot of prayers are not answered. This is why nothing happens in the churches. We're under an iron dome. People don't like to hear that. Oh, are you saying that we, when we pray, God doesn't hear it? That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm saying that an angel who went to see Daniel took 21 days to break through, and he had to go get help from Mike and the boys. That's biblical, book of Daniel. 
and Michael and his angels fight against the Prince of Persia, and they finally break through. That's chilling to me. And that's why did it take so long? Because the Prince of Persia, everybody under him, were doing human sacrifice on some level. I mean, the, the Babylonians, the Chaldees, all that stuff. Just go back and look. And they're sacrificing the you know human flesh to Moloch and Chemosh and all this stuff. I mean, it's all there. It, but, you know, we... Because the church has like stepped away from the supernatural and we don't really talk about it. And uh, just hi, just greet your neighbor. Now sing a couple of happy songs. Now sit down. Now, now you know, pass have a plate. special opportunity. I mean, yeah, pass the plate. And that's uh, a 20 minute something about whatever, and everybody leaves. So there is no supernatural for the most part in many of the churches. No one gets healed. When was the last time you saw anybody healed? And I'm not talking about some of these wahoos on Christian, so-called Christian TV, running around yelling and screaming. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God, moves decently in an order and something something happens, something good. And we don't wait on him anymore, so of course nothing happens because we never allow him to come in. We make sure that every minute of that service is, you know, but Russ Dizdar bags on this, and he's right. How, mu how much time do we devote to corporate prayer? Eight seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds? And there's a way you could you could yeah. get. We never break through. Pray. You're right. We don't do that. So I mean, I'm getting down too many rabbit holes. But the bottom line is, these are charged sites, and even though they're not occupied, stuff is manifesting. We show that in the film. Yeah, and and speaking of uh, you know warfare and stuff on these sites, can you tell us what happened to Henry Groover? He explains a story. What happened to him on the top of the Serpent Mound? Well, and I'd like to thank Steve Quayle for allowing me to use the audio of that. It was a, it was a um, Steve was was interviewing Henry. I met Henry at the first um, True Legends conference, and then saw him again at here the Watchman conference. He's just uh, amazing man. His wife passed away last year um, of, of decades, and I don't I don't think he's doing well right now. So if if the listeners can remember to lift him up in prayer, that would be great. But Henry is controversial because he goes to many of these places um, and and uh, claims reclaims the land for the Lord because these sites are defiled. Blood has been spilled. They're defiled sites. And so Henry is, is told by the Lord to go and do this, and he does. And that's his ministry. Is it my ministry? Uh-uh. I don't want to be involved in that unless God tells me to do that, and then that's fine. But he's got me doing what I'm doing, and I'm happy and content and having more fun than I probably should be allowed to have doing it. So the bottom line is Henry sees this sign on his way home to a Thanksgiving dinner, and it says Serpent Mound. And he goes, well, I'm going to go take care of that right now. So he goes there, and again, I've been there three different times. He goes there, a little itch on my nose here. He goes there, and it's snowing. There's about four to six inches of snow on the ground. And he gets out of his van, and he starts walking along the snake, um, and he gets up to the to the head, and he climbs up on on the head, and he begins to pray, and cancel what's gone on there. He does all that. He does the work. He's praying, talking out loud, casting down things. So as he leaves, um, he's walking his way out, and remember, there's four to six inches of snow. He's hit with something visceral. It is a force comes at him and smacks him in the solar plexus. Down on the ground he goes. It's just like. Boom! He's on the ground, holding his stomach. His knees are up into his chest, and, and he can't move. He can't un unfold himself, and he's trying to move, and he's, like, praying and trying to do whatever he can to get out of this, and he can't. And he realizes, and he says it in, in, the, in the film, you hear the audio, he realizes that he's going to freeze to death soon. He's been out there like 15, 20 minutes. He's going to freeze in the snow. And he realizes he's beginning to freeze to death. He's at that stage where the light bulb goes off and, you, and he goes, unless I do something, they're going to find me frozen. So he begins to pray, Father, why are you allowing this? And the Lord comes up and, and basically says, Henry, I didn't tell you to come here. You, I didn't tell you to come here. I will release you but I didn't tell you to come here and you will not come back here until you fasted and prayed. And I'll tell you to what duration you are to fast and pray. And then you'll bring a team in and, and do what you're going to do. 
So the Lord released him. Henry goes back to the van, starts it up, lays under this beaver blanket that he's got. And, you know, after like 40 minutes, the van's all heated up and he's warm and he drives back and he learned a powerful lesson. And that's why with us, you know, we don't go and do stuff unless the Lord tells us specifically to go and do stuff. Just don't go to these sites because they're highly charged. That's just one example. Wow. Well, yeah, we understand that lesson. Don't rush ahead of the Lord for sure. You also okay. mentioned in the film, there was a pastor, speaking of churches, there's a pastor that's kind of forced to deal with something. Can you can you elaborate on that? This is Pastor Tom Olson. And this guy doesn't want any limelight. He's just a down-to-earth, salt-of-the-earth pastor, loves the Lord, loves his congregation, been pastoring all his life. And uh, he was he was applied at a Lutheran church um, in Newark, Ohio. And one of the questions they asked him was, well, um, do you believe in deliverance? Do you know how to do deliverance? He said, no, I, I'm not sure. And But they hired him anyway. <laughs> So, uh, welcome in Newark, Ohio, right? So he starts getting calls from parishioners, and he's not sure, um, you know, what's what's going on. And uh, um, he goes out, and the people who are living in a house near a mound are seeing ghost wolves. There are no wolves in Ohio. So we're seeing ghost wolves. Another house is seeing an entire, what looks like an Indian village encampment, come in and go out. Go in and go out. Just like appear and disappear. There's another guy in a, in a full cowboy deal, on a horse, riding around, and he just disappears. What's more troubling is when he goes into one of these houses and... Uh, this is another home built next to a mound or on a mound. These people would open up the door to a crawl space. And in most instances, it would be a crawl space. Sometimes it wasn't. It was a bottomless pit. And they would throw stuff into this bottomless pit, this black maw, just bottomless pit. They'd throw stuff in it would never hit the bottom. And then they would close the door and come back a couple of days later. It's a crawl space again. So... The weirdest one, I think, as, as if that's not weird enough, the weirdest <laughs> one is when uh, Tom goes to a house, Pastor Olson goes to a house, and he walks in and there's a table levitating in the living room. So this wow. is like, these are charged sites. And again, in 2011, the, the Mayan elders uh, went there. The Mayan elders went to the Serpent Mount, went to the Great Circle Mount. And in the film, we show... About 30 seconds, you can hear the chanting. It's like, eee! they are, oh, yeah, I, I can't, just hearing it, you just kind of go, yeah. boy, some of us, you know, I don't want that in my spirit. I don't want that. When you hear it, you, you instantly know this is, you know, we're not, we're not praising the Lord here. There's something else going on here. And they're opening up a gateway. They're opening up a portal to allow the fallen ones in. It's like the Tower of Babel all over again. So, that's what we delve into in the film. And I think, you know, like I remember when Frank Peretti had his book, This Present Darkness, it went viral. This, you know, look, I did the film, I get it. But there's no reason why this film shouldn't go viral because it's not a novel. <laughs> it's the real thing. And, right. and it shows what's going on on the planet. You know, right here in America, well, for crying out loud. It's unbelievable. Well, yeah, and, and you know, people think Native Americans were the first here, and we don't know our history, and we haven't been shown. So my next question was, so the Mayan elders, why of all people would Mayan elders, why would they come to America to the Serpent Mound and do rituals? Well, they know. They, they know exactly who it is that they serve. I'll tell you another story about Hunbat's men, and I, I will use this in a later film. So you're the first people to hear this. No one knows this yet. When we were in Karnak, France, there were at one time upwards of 70,000 standing stones in Karnak. And these are not small little stones. These things weigh 20, 30 tons or more. And they're upright and they form rows. We were there. We flew the drone over. We spoke to probably the go-to man 
uh, all things Karnak. He's lived there 35 years. Um, his name is Howard Crowhurst. So Howard took us back because he wanted to show us these the largest dolmens, the, the largest standing stones in the complex. They're over 20 feet tall. They're huge, absolutely huge. Oh, and so wow. we're talking, he has no idea that episode three discusses Hunbat's men. He has no idea. He has no idea. And he says, yeah, when I was here with Hunbat's men, and I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. You were here with Hunbat's men? He goes, yeah, Hunbat's men had a tour, Crystal Skull tour. I go, you're yes. kidding me? He goes, no. He goes, yeah, they were here. And so I go, well, what happened? He said, well, the moment Humbat's men got into the area, he stopped the group and he said, I feel serpent energy here. First oh. thing he said. Not knowing that the rock that he was going, that Howard was going to take him to, this huge standing stone, had what archaeologists believe is the sign of a serpent. Whoa. So exactly, yeah, it's it's like it's like mind boggling. So these are charged sites. These are charged sites. And they are the Mayan elders, when 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 Humbat's man was there at Karnak, he was stunned because he realized that this was older than what he was used to. He was used to the stuff in in Chichen Itza, in, in the Mayan world, in America, the, the serpent mound. When he got to Karnak, he went. This is older. He knew. I mean, he's being told this because he's a shaman, because he's in touch with the serpent energy. So, I mean, that's that's why the Mayan elders with the crystal skull, 13 crystal skulls in 2011, came to America. And we talk about all this. You see, the Mayan elders know what these sites are, but the church, pa you know, pastors don't, and they won't talk about it. So here you are, you know, living from Ohio down to you know, the Gulf of Mexico, and stuff is going on, and you're not sure what why this is happening here. Why is there, why aren't prayers answered? Why is stuff manifesting? Why is there such high drug addiction in this one area? And guaranteed you can go back and trace it back to the mounds because these are charged sites and stuff is happening there. Wow. So those elders brought 13 crystal skulls to America and opened all these different sites across the United States. Do you think they're linked to sites around the world, like a great awakening or something? <laughs> I, know, I, know, I know stuff that I, I can't, I can't reach can't out say. yet. Okay. I, I can't because it's, it's, it's stuff that we discovered that no one else knows about. And the way things work in, in Christian ministries, someone will hear that and steal it. I will say this, though. I will say this because I've already written about this. It's in the book On the Trail of a Nephilim. And it's the work of, uh, of Kelsey Stone, whose grandfather bought. Yeah, there you go. You could actually. Yeah, that's the book. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's all under one book. Hold on. I'll show you. What we did is... We took Armor Trail 1 and 2. We took Armor Trail 1 and 2 and put it all under one book. It's six. It's 600 pages, 350 full-color photos, and that's Chief Joseph. That's me with the, with the Nephilim Lance. I just yep. gave you an idea. So it's, it's all under one roof now, and cool. the DNA evidence is in the back of the book. All the all the DNA evidence is, is in the back of the book on on the Paracas skulls. So Kelsey Stone is um, the grandson, and he, and he's been he's been there all his life. Okay, uh, at at this place in New Hampshire, and the America Stonehenge is a circle, and there's standing stones alignments. So when you stand. In the center of the hinge, and you look out at the standing stone, you can see the, the sunrise, the summer solstice sunrise, <coughs> and also the summer solstice sunset. So what he did is he drew a line from the center of his hinge out to the summer solstice standing stone. That's right there. There's the line. And he extended the line on the next page. Okay. Having no, this is done on Google Earth, having no idea where it went. And he winds up intersecting 
the center trilithon in Stonehenge, England. Oh, wow. So I've already written about that, and that's why I'm free, I, I can talk about it. Because that's the work of Kelsey Stone. He allowed me to publish it in the book. <clears throat> that ain't a, a coinkadink. Mm -mm. there, there was a grid system here. And what I think they were is entities could pop and travel from one place to another. That's total conjecture on my part, but that's what I think they may have been used for. Well, that's actually in line with... They're all connected. Yeah, that's in line with what we've studied about ley lines and stuff, how they travel. That's interesting. Same thing. Wow. So what's the takeaway from the film? In your opinion, what would you want, like, if this is new to our audience, what do you want them to grasp? Well, that the supernatural, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you something here. This is from two pastor friends of mine. Um, let me just get it up here for a second. And I've known these people for years. All right. They've known me for years. And as soon as it gets up there, and this is, this is what they write. Uh, episode three, um, Secrets of a Supernatural Voices from the Other Side is a real must-see. It's informative, well-presented worldview changing film. Knowing LA for decades, hearing and seeing his ongoing research, this film in particular connects the dots to help everyone, especially Christians, recognize the fingerprints of the prince of the power of the air all over the globe. As spiritual warfare ramps up, is it is it <laughs> It is a sign that reveals a Luciferian plan to deceive and raise up a counterfeit to preempt Christ's return. That's from Gary and Karen Zethris. They're pastor friends of mine <coughs> out in California. So, I mean, that just gives you an idea of what, um, this is what Steve Quayle wrote as soon as it comes up. Um, L.A. Marzulli lays out the root of a supernatural evil in a wonderfully anointed presentation. So many just deal with the fruit of evil, but L.A. goes to the very root of all evil, the fallen ones. The Nephilim are the originators of all evil exhibited against the living God and his followers and demonstrates in real time the power in the name of Jesus. When L.A. rebuked the evil powers in Jesus' name, the word holy came up on the obelisk machine, demonstrating that the name of Jesus is the most powerful name in the universe when appropriated by faith. Tremendous job, L.A., as your team of experts are some of the most powerful and anointed men of God I know. This is a mandatory watch, in my opinion. I mean, I can't ask for a more glowing report, especially from Steve Quayle. So, you know, I was very, really honored to get that from Steve. And by the way, I'll be speaking at the True Legends Conference uh, in September, September 13th to the 15th. So Brand. I think it's sold out, but you can get you can get live streaming. So that's something to think about. Yeah, for sure. So are you okay? Do you need a break or anything before we go on to some more questions? Uh, yeah, how much How much longer are we going to go? Uh, maybe 15 minutes. That's fine. That's good. All right. So really quickly, you just mentioned the Ovilus. So you took the Newark Paranormal, you took a Newark Paranormal group with your friend and fellow researcher, Fritz Zimmerman. Can you tell us what happened on that obelisk? Because that's what I love about ULA is your prayers. Yeah. Um, so Fritz, <laughs> Fritz is contacted by the Newark uh, Paranormal Group. They want to come along to see if there's any activity there. So I have no idea who these people are. I don't know what a paranormal group does. I probably <laughs> should have done more homework, right? So I don't know. So, I mean, they're out there with us. And Fritz takes us to Geller Hill. Now, Geller Hill is the highest hill uh, in, the, in the county. And it forms, the top of the hill forms a perfect isosceles triangle with the center of the Newark Circle Mound and the center of the Octagon Mound. And that, again, is not a coincidence. It's about one, it's over a mile apart from these things. So this is all really amazing stuff. So we're out there on Geller Hill with Fritz Zimmerman. And, uh, and the Newark Paranormal Group, and it's raining. So I can't fly the drone, we can't film. There's a forest like right, right at the top of the hill, entrance to the forest, so we go in there. It's a manicured forest, it's well-groomed, it's got a nice wide path. And so this woman, Ray, Ray, uh, uh, Ray Lynn, um, turns on this machine, it's called an ovulus. 
I've never seen one of these things. I have no idea what it does. She turns on the obelisk, and about a minute later, we hear the word evil. And we kind of go, whoa, I don't know, what the heck is that? And uh, Ray Linda be begins to explain that this machine has 5,000 words in it. And because of electronics, allegedly, spirits, ghosts, demons, whatever, can access it. We know that the, the fallen ones can do this. They, they mess with the grid. They can mess with your home electronics. I mean, they do this, which is why in the film, Dr. Michael Lake says we should, you know, take authority over this and pray over our electronics more often. Mm -hmm. This is real stuff. So I'm kind of going, well, that's kind of weird. And I'm processing it. You know, I'm kind of going like, something's not right here, but I can't put my finger on it. We walk down into the woods another 50 feet, whatever. And um, the second word appears, which. And at that moment, I go, okay, I know what this is. And I'm going to take authority over this. And I do. I pray. It's all on camera. It's not staged. Everything you see mm -hmm. is not staged. You can't stage this. It's there on film as it's happening. We had no idea what we were getting into. So once I hear the word witch, I go, I go in the name of Jesus, I, I cancel your assignment over this area. You are forbidden to access to this machine or anyone around it in the name of Jesus. So we do this, and Ray Lynn turns off the obelisk machine, and, I, and she waits about 20 seconds, and she says, turn it on. I go, yeah, go ahead, turn it on. So she turns it on me, wait, and there's a voice that comes out of the machine that's part of the machine. It's not like a demon speaking through it. And, and the voice and the word come up, holy. And she does this. She goes, her jaw drops. <laughs> She's never seen anything like it before. Wow, She's blown away, completely blown away by what she's looking at. And basically, you know, the presence of a living God, the spirit of a living God showed up and stopped the nonsense. So they shooed me out of there because I was ruining the party, as it were. And, and I went down to the cars because we couldn't film. And they tried with their machines for like another 45 minutes and got nothing. We shut down the whole thing. I didn't shut it down. The Lord did. The Lord shut Amen. down the thing. And that's what he does. We as believers have the authority to go up against powers and principalities. But we have to be careful who we go up against and when we go up against it. This was something that was right, right in my face. I had to deal with it. And I did. Um, and, and, you know, when I say I did, the spirit of the living God did. I just use the authority I have in Jesus, um, his armor, you know, his putting, putting on the armor of God. It's all him that's doing it. I'm just, but he shares that with us, which is amazing. He shares that. He shows us the way it works, which is incredible. So we got the victory that day. But that is, you know, when you see it, you know, I'm telling you now, but when you watch it unfold in the film, it's just mind-boggling. And then afterwards, we do a couple of follow-ups with, with Joe Campbell, the head of the North Paranormal Group, as well as Raylene Galen, and talk to her about, you know, what, what she saw and what happened. I mean, both... They were, they were really impacted by what they had seen, really impacted. Well, yeah, what a witness. And, you know, we teach spiritual warfare here. So all you have to do is say your request and put Jesus's name on it. And that's what I love about, you know, the simplicity of what you're asking is just, hey, Lord, I need you to do this. And I'm asking in your name. I watched uh, Watchers. I was there, you know, watching when you prayed for the chip, for the, chip, for the insert to show up. Right. The yeah, it's the same. Yeah, the power of prayer. And when the Lord shows up, He shows up, and the atmosphere Amen. changes, and everything changes. So, there you go. Amen. Quite a witness. Well, Rach, I know uh, we're going to do a drawing today. Are there any like final questions or anything for LA? Any final thoughts, LA, uh, before we talk about how we can promote this incredible film? Well, I, I thank you both for having me on. I just, um, you know, we've we've got. Um, three films in the series, and, and, and they're all standalone films. But when you watch it from one to three, you see the progression, and then the, the viewer will begin to realize that what we're looking at here really are the fingerprints of a supernatural. So it's, uh, what can I tell you? LAMarzuli.net, LAMarzuli.net, and you can avail yourself of what I think is vital information. Wow. Oh, careful. <laughs> I was looking for your book, Further Evidence. 
because you were the person that told me that demons are, you know, aliens. Aliens are demons. So mm -hmm. he's got a lot more on his website, you guys, than just this film. He's been researching for years. And it's just our pleasure um, and, quite frankly, answered prayer that you're even doing this show with us yes. today. So it's awesome. Amen. Oh, it's an honor, Thank ladies. you, it's sir. And before we go to the drawing, what's next on your docket, L.A.? Uh, well, I've, we've got four conferences. They're almost back-to-back. -back. We go to Steve Quell's conference, San Antonio conference, um, uh, which will be a really good conference, the one in San Antonio. Then the Prophecy Watchers conference right here in Oklahoma. And that same weekend, I'm double booked. I fly out to Irvine early Saturday morning. So I'll speak Friday night at the uh, Prophecy Watchers conference in Oklahoma, take the 7 o'clock flight out to L.A., go to Irvine, speak that afternoon, and uh, then, you know, we're, we're off. So we have four conferences back to back. That'll close out the year. Right now I'm working on episode four, which is on the DNA, the Paracas skulls, yeah. the elongated skull. So we're showing this whole anthology from 2013 to the present and what we've discovered. It's never been done before. Oh, we've wow. kind of talked about it. We had a, one book, which was, a, which was a disaster, and they all burn in the fire. And um, the press conference also was a disaster. So it's, I got the guys back together. We did it right here in the studio, and um, I'm excited about that, and I'm working on that now. Oh, well, that's good. exciting. We'll, we'll keep you in prayer for all your projects. Thank you. you do wonderful it. work. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Amen. So, yeah. Hi, Rach. So, any, we're drawing winners of uh, those that commented below. And so, later, if you watch this and you weren't a part of the live show, that's okay. Uh, if you go to You Had Me at Coffee and place an order, you get $15 off and get entered to win. Uh, we'll do another drawing August 31st. So, we got our little spinner wheel. Do you see it? I'm going to click the button. <laughs> <laughs> Rachel's toys. <laughs> Linda Lopez. Linda Lopez. Woo. All right, Linda. Yes. Woo. Okay, Linda. I think we have your address, Linda, but send it to send, us yeah. <laughs> again. And uh, just be sure we have the right address and we'll send you a copy of Secrets of the Supernatural. And again, if you're not watching the live show, go to youhadmeatcoffee.com, use promo code LA Moms, and get $15 off your coffee order, and uh, also be entered to win another copy. Yay! Yeah, we're gonna buy, we're gonna be buying some coffees from ULA. Thank yes. you for your time, sir. We enjoyed thank you. it. Thank you, thank you. It's great to be here, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Yes, thank you. Bye, yeah, LA. Bye, God bless. Bye. Bye. Blessings. Bye.